Chapter 5. Pain and Justice Quoting, Thus spoke Zarathustra on old and new tablets. There are many good inventions on earth, some useful, some pleasing. For their own sake, the earth is to be loved. So, would a raving individualism be Nietzsche's last word? Did he leave behind for us nothing but the incentive for the production of ecstatic free thinkers in their reckless physicality, their amoral intensity, and their suspicious second innocence? We might ask, where is the social her Nietzsche? Are your ecstasies still grounded on the constitution? Doesn't your commonplace conceal the landmines of anarchy? What do you have to say about the problems of the present, or will you limit yourself to a reference to the discrepancy between isolated knowledge and collective banter? Is all that we can expect of you a subjectivity without a subject, which, if thought out further as a general principle, cannot produce anything more than a postmodern colloquium entitled The Autumn Salon of Vanities, upon which intensities collapse into each other in a manner that is guaranteed to be meaning-free and polylogical. Only bodies remaining without worlds? Only actors remaining with no engagement? Only adventurers with no retirement insurance? Only projects of antiquity without the realism of late capitalism? Only the new vehemence without diplomacy in the social state? Do you intend to invite us into the chaos with your young conservative romanticism of conflict and your Dionysian prowess in the art of breaking barriers? Don't your cult of the moment and your worship of the exception bring the socio-political premises of democracy to ruin? That is, the capacities to engage oneself communicably, to engage in long-term thinking, and to feel within the context of the institution. Isn't there inherent within every individualistic agitation a playing with fire, an impulse towards the relaxation of restraint, which encourages brutality and intimidates caution, which defends a loss of control and robs the breath of responsibility? Isn't any emphasis on the singular at the same time a pillaging of the general, which thus contributes to an increase in tension between narcissism and the Grundgesetz? You will become a danger to political culture, her Nietzsche, if you don't cease seducing those who are most sensitive into political resignation. Not to mention those hardened types who borrow risque doctrines from your writings, so that they can carry out their brutality with a clear conscience. Which brand of politics was it then that thought it had found in your energetic romanticism a permit to start swinging? Do we have to make it any clearer? What these questions allude to, assuming a, minimum rec a minimal recall of political ideas, is clear enough. Their bluntness, however, stems from perceptions that are themselves imprecise. It stems from a definition of the world that is fundamentally false, and that disintegrates into radical ambiguities as soon as this definition has been discredited. It presumes that in a normal society is simply a matter of bringing together individuals who have grown up exhibiting an average sense of goodwill for the purpose of solving their common problems cooperatively. Whoever withdraws from this kind of cooperation because he wants something different falls under suspicion of being someone who is running away from reality, or some other type of irresponsible subject, who conceals his blindness for the social behind therapeutic and private ideologies of retreat, and who in the worst cases makes excuses for himself with Nietzsche's formulation of the aesthetic exoneration of life. This opinion, which probably considers itself the healthy one, disintegrates under the first alert gaze into fragments, each of which is counterfeit, beginning with the pseudo-ontological concept of normality, moving on to the trivially moralistic postulate of goodwill, 
and continuing all the way to the self-dominating, inflated, vulgar ontological block that, in the form of the bipartite illusion of the individual here and society there, stems in the way of any deeper understanding. Ultimately, as summarised in the vulgar political compulsive idea of the quote-unquote common purpose, only quote-unquote common values are lacking here as ontological catch-alls. One cannot, of course, permit the use of the term deeper understanding with its educated bourgeois gemutlichkeit. He who moves on from the word to the matter itself, Zaka, is pulled into a dramatic phenomenon whose wake the vulgar ontological block to a Dionysian understanding melts away. It is little wonder then that critical identities rebel against an understanding of this kind as they would against something that mortally endangered the population. Because truth indicates something terrible for the subjects of the status quo. It is only natural that they would defend themselves from behind their block against the enlightening phenomenon, the drama. They react critically because they really do not want to find what they purport to be seeking. This much can be made plausible without any great effort. For the person who experiences existence as a drama that takes place above the Dionysian foundation of pain and pleasure, and who is the alert individual who must not approach such an experience occasionally, moral and social facts must appear as subordinate qualities, however much they try to force themselves into the discourses of the institution, as realities of the first order. Nietzsche's theory of truth explains to us in the most impressive terms that what calls itself reality within the context of institutional discourse can be nothing other than a reality in place of a reality. An Apollonian explanation, ritualization, and institutionalization of the foundations of the world, Weltgrundes, in accordance with the criteria of endurability and predictability. But in the alert individual, this self-representation can never become exclusive. The, evident, the individual is always standing at the crossroads. He is always alive only to the extent that he is a meeting point between the Dionysian and the Apollonian, i.e. that he occupies the position where in reality, in its incapacity to be represented, represented encounters the institutional, quote, reality in the place of reality, end quote, that can be verbalized. It could therefore be that individuals who are alert to Dionysus are most decidedly not trying to dodge reality, but are rather the only ones who are able to survive in the vicinity of pain and pleasure, with all the ramifications of the survival for a metabolic exchange. Stoffwechsel. Between the individual and nature, life and society, while, conversely, the completely politicised, completely socialised and thoroughly moralised subjects would be the very ones who were most successful in their organised flight from the terrible truth. It is conceivable that no one is more translucent, authentic, more incorporated, or more life-enhancing in their involvement in what is real than these Dionysian individuals, these types who are unclassifiable, oversensitive, apolitical or parapolitical. Perhaps it is they who engage themselves in an ecology of pain and pleasure that precedes any of the usual politics. Perhaps they are the real proto-politicians, as opened to those who have specialised in politics with a capital P, and those who, in the style of traditional activists, endlessly force their game as the administrators of abuses and the agents of a shifting of suffering onto others. Here a crack blatantly forms in the concept of the political itself. It will be necessary to supplement an everyday in a concept of the political, as the plane of combative and discursive interests along with their discourses weapons and institutions, with a darker, nighttime concept of the political, 
that casts its gaze on the hidden ecology of universal pain. While politics, according to its everyday conceptualization, belongs to the Apollonian world of visibility, and unfolds before our eyes as a reality in place of a reality, the dark side of the political falls on the side of the Dionysian, the non-concrete, energetic, of a prototypical foundation of pain and pleasure, which is a prerequisite to all everyday political action and reaction. Within this dark conceptualization, the most sensitive problematic of modernity is announced. We are inquiring into the relationship between modern day constructions of what is socially endurable on the one hand, and the undurable proliferation of suffering brought about by precisely such constructions of what can be endured on the other. With this sort of dark inquiry, only one thing is obvious. Wherever thought of this kind takes place, the logic of politology, politologian, from Machiavelli to Marx and from Hobbes to Ho Chi Minh, has already been superseded by a Dionysian politology of passions. This is a dangerous thought. How else could it be defined? Is it the usual anarchic romantic flirtation with the abyss? The well-known playing with fire, which leads to the potential for conflict within the masses. A literary sharpening of an asocial explosive that every socialized subject carries within him. These are imputations with which any thinking in this area will have to reckon. I do believe, however, that one of the fundamental impulses of modernity is continued through such questions. In its best moments, enlightenment was always a phenomenon in the spirit of a Dionysian politology. Authentic modernity accomplished an immeasurable departure from the feudal ontology of misery. Reader's note, here Slodzike uses the Latin misery. Which was grounded in the fact that the very fewest had permitted the greatest number to suffer. A departure in which liberalism, Marxism, anarchism, social democracy, and political Catholicism by and large have come to terms with each other. The modern pain ecological consensus that the great majority will not allow themselves to be made to suffer for the minority forever is the smallest common denominator for all the positions available within the fissured landscapes of modernity. Modernization has been accomplished for the most part as a mass entrance on the part of suffering subjects into what has been rendered newly endurable, into alleviations, authorizations and enrichments that, when measured against traditional standards, were so overpowering that one was for a long time at a loss even to pose the question as to the ecology of their unburdening efforts. This inability to pose the question has been coming to an end within the context of a dramatic awakening that has been taking place over the last several decades. With spectacular speed, the feeling has spread that modernity cannot be satisfied with an exoneration of life from the ethos of technical improvement, political participation and economic enrichment but that it also longs for a Dionysian exoneration of life in the sense of an algodicy. This feeling is the epochal basis for Nietzsche's new currency. As we see, the religious question has survived the end of religions. It now appears, insofar as it is articulated at the heights of modernity, as the question of the possibility of an aesthetic exoneration of life. Of course, this question ultimately ties in with doubts as to the value and longevity of any improvements, and the possibility of realising general participation, doubts that have taken on epidemic proportions. In addition to this, these questions have their foundation in a scepticism vis-à-vis the moralism of social political modernity that is rapidly becoming radicalised. The scepticism allows us to ask whether, 
in the moralism of the Enlightenment, the legitimate voice of wounded life that is demanding its restitution can really be heard. Or whether the syndrome of moralizing social activism has not long since unwillingly become part and parcel of the tendencies that, from the behind the pretext of further improvement and humanitarian progress, lead to an unprecedented proliferation of suffering. In a situation such as this, what could be more suggestive than Nietzsche's doctrine of the aesthetic exoneration of life? Whoever takes the aesthetic into consideration as an exonerating force has broken through the spell of the moralistic concept of exculpation that clings to the Protestant wing of modernity in particular, and has burdened us with liberties full of dyspeptic moral discourses. With its assertions in this respect, Nietzsche's birth of tragedy has won a philosophical breadth that exceeds everything debated prior to it. For with a recklessness that is still astonishing today, Nietzsche cut through the moral knots of modernity. He naturalistically reversed the relationship between morality and life. Instead of finding fault with life from the perspective of an eternally dissatisfied morality, he began by observing morality from the perspective of an eternally unimprovable life. This reversal provides the suggestive statement that, quote, the existence of the world can be justified only as an aesthetic phenomenon, end quote. And its penetrating power, and explains why it is unacceptable for those who even today maintain the primacy of the moral. On the question of pain, the intellectuals are divided. Actually, we are dealing with two diametrically opposed definitions of what constitutes the pain of life. The moral political definition, which unjustly and for too long has wanted to be perceived as the only legitimate voice of enlightenment, recognises in almost all pain a variation of injustice, and derives from it a program for its redress that expands into socio-political, indeed historical philosophical perspectives. Moralistic theoretical modernity wants to respond to the question of algodicy with its progressive universal analgesic, in which pain can only find acknowledgement of its own potential abolition as an ontological motif. That this is an uncontemptible view that becomes apparent as reasonable within an intermediate area does not require confirmation. A great majority of therapeutic action has been grounded on its plausibility. He who has suffered and found release knows how to evaluate its truth content. Was it not also Nietzsche who most clearly expressed what grief had to say about itself? Be gone. Accordingly, Nietzsche's algodicy stands in direct opposition to a program of moral, of moral abrogation. In a manner that is completely antiquated, it pits our memory of the ethos of the affirmative resistance against the modern idea of an abolishing, abolishing negation. Because it conceives of life in a radically imminent fashion, as the play acted out upon the foundation of pleasure and pain that cannot be overcome, it negates any metaphysics of redemption, including its modern manifestations and programs for the elimination of pain and therapy. Would this imply that Nietzsche was a Stoic in the wrong century? Or does an irredeemable Christ want to throw the promise of the Christian age with neoclassical gestures onto the wreckage? Quoting page 490. Dionysus versus the Crucified. There you have the opposition. It is not a difference with respect to martyrdom. It has a different meaning. Life itself. Its eternal fertility in return requires agony, destruction, the will to annihilation. On the other hand, suffering, the crucified one as the innocent, functions as an objection to this life, as a formula for condemning it. One guesses, the problem is that of the meaning of suffering, whether this be a Christian meaning or a tragic meaning. 
in the former case it is meant to be the path to a divine being. In the latter, being is considered divine enough to vindicate a monstrous amount of suffering. The tragic human being still affirms the harshest suffering. The Christian will negate even the happiest destiny on earth. The God on the cross is the curse upon life, a cue to redeem oneself from it. The Dionysus who has been cut to pieces is a promise of life. It is eternally reborn and brought back from destruction. Nietzsche's doctrine of the aesthetic exoneration of life reveals itself as the opposite of cynical aestheticism. It is grounded in an algodicy that attempts to draw pain into the imminence of a life that no longer requires redemption as an element of the Dionysian passion. Within the Dionysian passion, which forms the basis for every alert life, there occurs, paradoxically, that which we have characterized as the endurance of the unendurable. But this endurance is not without its digressions. Rather, it has two indispensable assistants in the form of intoxication and the dream. The oldest of drugs for elevating the psyche. They contribute to the formation of those intermediate worlds and realms of endurability that we need to keep ourselves from perishing of immediacy. Here the thesis that the birth of tragedy must be read as Apollonian in its dramaturgical effect again becomes important. The book had shown how Dionysian passion had been instructed by means of an Apollonian translation into something that can be looked at, imagined and endured. In this book, Nietzsche professes culture, the compulsion to symbolize, representation. That this profession has a double base was made just as clear, for if culture then wanted to belong in general to the world of illusion, it would be a matter of an illusion that does not permit anyone to look through it, because it is the true lie of life itself. Accordingly, culture would be the fiction that we ourselves are. We exist as self-inventions of the living being that has been brought forth from the unendurability of the immediate Dionysian passion into a state of endurability and mediation. Life itself owes its spontaneous elevation to culture, to a dialectic of what can be endured and what is unendurable. The dialectic from which the process of self-representation has sprung. From this, the ethics can be conceptualized from Nietzsche's basic assertions that is commensurate with the universal experience of modernity. The ethics of necessary illusion, of what is endurable, of intermediate worlds, an ethics of the ecology of pleasure and pain, an ethics of ingenuous life. The concept of illusion in Nietzsche possesses a power that bridges the contradiction between the ethical and the aesthetic, and indeed between the therapeutic and the political. Under Nietzsche's gaze, the world of moral and political institutions is presented as a sphere of essential illusion as a form of self-composition of collective life, which, in order to endure itself, must symbolize itself, ritualize itself, and subordinate itself to values. These suppositions form the Apollonian backbone of culture. One could, vis-a-vis -vis his book on tragedy, compare them to what was initially said about Nietzsche's constructions of the tragic stage. They would be like these Apollonian support mechanisms, through whose efficiency a culturally endurable arrival of the Dionysian would become possible for the first time. But the normative sphere of law, mores, conventions and institutions receives its legitimation from life's compulsion toward art, not from the autonomy of the universal law of morals, Zitten. however in order to remain valid, Moral law must appear in the guise of autonomy and universality. There will be no Apollonian ethics without Dionysian foundation, but there can also be no Dionysian ethics without Apollonian fictions of autonomy. This means that after Nietzsche, 
there can no longer be a theory of culture that is not informed by fundamental ironies. Nietzsche did indeed shift moral and cultural critical thought onto the track of naturalism, but he also broke open naturalism aesthetically and illusionistically. He localised this compositional, inventive, lying phenomenon with the phenomenon of life itself. Thus we see through everything that has been culturally imposed to its natural basis. This basis is at the same time, however, what ascends to the cultural and is composed into value systems. Thus human consciousness is placed ontologically in an ironic sight, one from which the pretending animal is condemned to see through his own fictions. His awakening to this irony is at the same time an awakening to philosophy. It is not an irony that could lead to detachment, nor an understanding that would provide distance. At this sight, the mechanism for maintaining distance from life through knowledge breaks down. But one must play with that from which one is unable to distance oneself. Nietzsche's algodicy, therefore, conceals the beginnings of a philosophical ethics. An ethics that clearly rests on a foundation of tragic irony, because the moral illusion belongs to the self-composition of life. A naturalistic self-awareness is also not permitted to want to return to moral compositions. They belong irrevocably to the cybernetics of social beings. The Apollonian, conceived of cybernetically, signifies nothing other than the necessity of imprinting upon the amorphous compulsion of Dionysian forces and the chaotic multiplicity of the individual a controlling form, which is ruled by the law of moderation, individuality, self-limitation and rationality. The concept of quote-unquote justice is a true dream of humanity, born out of the unendurability of unjust conditions. It belongs to the self-regulation of life in the intermediate worlds of endurable homeostasis. It is a component of the compressive compositions of self. Excuse me. It is a component of the comprehensive compositions of self that we refer to as cultures. But because everything just and all morality are to be understood as controlling forces in the cybernetics of the unendurable, the ironic shadow cast over the postulate, cast by the postulate of the autonomy and universality of justice will never again be skipped over. Where values are, there ironies shall be. The slick Apollonian belief in values and their autonomy cannot be reproduced in modernity. If ethics is cybernetics, we can understand why it pursues no objectives but rather processes breakdowns. It is a typically modern error to believe that ethics might change the world, to guarantee the Apollonian natural right to an endurable life. Nietzsche has classically formulated the regulative character of the ethical Apollonian in that he advances the claim that only as much of the Dionysian foundation of pleasure and pain should be permitted to surface in an individual as, quote, can be again subdued by the Apollonian force of transfiguration, end quote. Is it possible to conceive of a more sublime acknowledgement of culture? Here the concept of righteousness appears in an unusual significance, for Nietzsche states further on in the same discussion, quote, Thus these two art drives must unfold their powers in a strict proportion, according to the law of eternal justice, end quote. Justice now becomes the heading for a homeostatic ethics, the necessity of which is based on the self-regulation of living processes. Nietzsche formulates this paradoxically enough, quote, all that exists is just and unjust and equally justified in both, end quote, from page 72. He who expresses himself in this way does not sit at his desk and draw up the plans for better worlds. 
does not analytically pull to pieces the moral vocabulary of his nation and, on the basis of this accomplishment, take himself for a philosopher. He who speaks in this way has, through experimentation on his own body, thrust forward into the tissue of reality and cast his gaze into the ecology of suffering life. Of course, this has for some time been a matter of what is dealt with in formal ethics or doctrines of material value. Behind the altercations between good and evil and the contest of values for cultural or political priority, there arises, defiant and threatening, the central philosophical massif of modernity. The question of understanding subjectivity as such. With the introduction of a cybernetic concept of justice, Something decisive has clearly taken place, something that is heavy with implications, and that must remain plainly incomprehensible and unacceptable to those who have inscribed upon their flags the illusion of the moral autonomy of the subject and the superstition of free will. The moral subject, whether it is called individual, citizen, entity with legal rights, human being or whatever, has with this turn of events already been released from its fictional central position in the moral cosmos. It has become de-centred into a great force within the play of subjective forces. Here the question of whether a surrender or release of the subject has taken place must remain unanswered. A decision on this could not be made readily in any case. It is not unthinkable that only a de-centering of the subject which bids a respectful adieu to the fiction of autonomy, could lead to a legitimate constitution of subjectivity, beyond ego and will. What seems at first a bitter expulsion from the centre could be viewed on second glance as an adventurous enrichment. If it is correct that, in becoming conscious of having been dissented, the subject is anyway only giving up what it never possessed, its autonomy, and is gaining what it would have to lose to the illusion of autonomy, the play of its body and its dialogic ecstatic status. Whereas the centred subject is the effect of a grammatical system that harasses to death the living consciousness between thou shalt and I want, the decentered subject would perhaps be the first to have the right to say in reference to itself, I am. What is to be gained from these speculations? Assuming that they pointed in the direction of fruitful insights, who would gain by learning to accept a cybernetic version of justice and seeing in it a radical, constructive, selective force that belongs to the constructive nature of vital self-composition? The significance of these speculations lies presumably only in their ramifications for the self-definition of the phenomenon of enlightenment because enlightenment represents a historic wager on the realisation of a reasoning subjectivity. The subject of enlightenment is radically moved by a transformation of this concept of the subject, from a moral legal centre of will to a cybernetic and medial phenomenon. This is no small matter. It is presumably an all-or-nothing situation being put into play within the context of philosophical thought. The subject of enlightenment could, from this point forward, no longer constitute itself as it had wanted to in accordance with the rules of Apollonian illusionism, as an autonomous source of meaning, ethos, logic and truth, but instead as something medial, cybernetic, eccentric and Dionysian, as a site of sensibility within the ruling cycles of forces, as a point of alertness for the modulation of impersonal antagonisms, as a process of self-healing for primordial pain, and an instance of the self-composition of primordial pleasure, to speak poetically as an eye through which Dionysus observes himself. Measured against such conceptions of medial subjectivity, the moral constructivism of the Enlightenment must appear naive. If indeed the vision of a universal dominion of morality is derived from this, thus naivety becomes a hysteria, a procreation of demons in the air, an impotent self-begetting of Apollonian illusion. In his critique of morality, Nietzsche presents us with a minimum of a second reflection. 
without which the Enlightenment for its part would remain only a natural illusion. A morality without morals is unthinkable, however, without an aesthetic relationship to the necessary illusion. Quoting from page 143, If we could imagine dissonance become man, and what else is man? This dissonance, to be able to live, would need a splendid illusion that would cover dissonance with a veil of beauty. End quote. The Apollonian veil is just as moral as it is aesthetic in nature, and is woven in particular from the most magnificent of all self-disillusionments, which the Enlightenment had characterised as the moral autonomy of the subject. Thus man, according to his moral ecology, is a fragment of suffering, dreaming, building and valuing nature that, in order to endure itself, needs the illusion of freedom from merely suffering naturalness. These thoughts are anything but pleasant. They indicate that Nietzsche's doctrine of the aesthetic exoneration of life does not represent a program of frivolity. To a much greater extent, it is one of the most serious attempts, perhaps the only promising one, to think through the moral situation of modernity without being duped into the more complex swindle of a new morality. The seriousness of this attempt is connected with the audacity of the attack against recent abstract subjectivism. There shines forth from Nietzsche's project the beginnings of a return to the physical foundation of justice, comparable to the return of the physical foundation of thought discussed in chapter 4. In both cases, the truth is speaking as a truth from below, not as an idea in search of a body, but as an intelligent body that, out of respect, accelerates itself in the course of its composition of self towards language, toward the intellect, and towards justice in a manner that is stringently perspectival, constructive, eliminating, and destructive. However, the notion that knowledge does not fall from heaven, but instead opens itself up to us through a dramatic revelation of previously concealed worldly realities, is the fundamental concept of authentic modernity. Regardless of whether it speaks uh, scientific, depth, psychological, Marxist, labour-oriented, anthropological or fundamentally ontological idiom, in the ciphers of physicality a Dionysian materialism is announced, of which dialectical materialism is only a brutal caricature. With these observations, we leave the realm within which we had been able to read the birth of tragedy as an aesthetic theory, with cultural philosophical sidelines. In my concluding remarks, I will attempt to advance Nietzsche's model to a level at which his book on tragedy will take on a wide range, truth historical profile. It actually seems to us as if Nietzsche, along with the major proportion of his work, belonged within the history of the in languaging, versprachlichung, and self-mobilization of physis, that is incalculable but global in its implications. A phenomenon, therefore, for which the expression Dionysian materialism was used, an expression whose plausibility goes hand in hand with its unapproachability. The talk of materialism within modernity runs the risk of being complicit with the most brutal subjectivisms and the most cynical forms of objectifying thought. And yet the materialist confession wanted, in accordance with its spirit, to reconcile with matter as the not-other of spirit. It strove to mediate the metaphysics that was unhappily hovering above the physical basis with it, and to call home the logical ghosts. Modern materialism, outlined in a quasi-maternally legitimate withdrawal of idealism, established itself almost universally as the form of thought for ultimate violation and the final seizure of power, and it seems to me that there belongs with it a belief that is more despairing than naive towards the historical potential and the power of self-control of modernity, in order to once again conjure up from beneath the unity of modernity and the spirit of a Dionysian materialism, and a medial process of becoming universal. 
be that as it may, this thought always has the greater power, the more consequential structure, and the deeper universal capacity for containment vis-a-vis -vis numerous retrogressive metamorphoses, enclosures and degenerations. It is a thought that conceives of itself as materialist and Dionysian, because it is permitted to believe in itself as a medium for a singularly phenomenal, drastic universality. It knows that it has been incorporated into a planetary magnetism of physical universal candor, Weltoffenheit, that shows us that every delimitation of subjectivity that does not become super-egotistical raving flows into trips around the world that parade before our eyes where our effective limits lie. Within these trips around the world on the part of a cosmonautical and a psychonautical reason that are both limitless and final at once, the freedoms of the modern era find their first fragile meaning. Cosmonautical reason concerns itself with the planets as the source and basis of a worldwide communion. World trade, world communication, and world ecology. And when in crisis, world war. Psychonautical reason, on the other hand, queries the individual as to his capacity to endure the universal citizenship into which he was born. For this reason, I believe, the psychologies that have been developing continuously on European terrain for the last 200 years are the essential component of authentic enlightenment. They are the symbolic vehicle of psychonautical reason, that is, any form of self-reflection that gives a voice to our condition of being condemned to universality, even into the very depths of the subject. Within the phenomenon of Dionysian materialism, the individual psyche must be confronted with the advent in an increasingly violent and subtle contextualization of what constitutes the world. It must learn to liberate the unceasing unveiling of a world of worlds from its initial unendurability and recast it into something that can be endured. It must learn to accept into itself the impact of the much too much which arrives from without in order to correspond to the external opening of worlds through an increase in inner openness to the world. Dionysus is the deity who also protects the ecstasies of learning. The fundamental, rare question for modern psychologies, which the Dionysians of an act of materialism must render animate from the outside in, is the following. How can individuals who are imprinted by regionality finiteness and fear of death in a way, in any way, endure being affiliated with a planetary fact. To formulate this in the language of Heidegger, how can finite being, design, endure being thrown into an irrepressible universality? Nothing is more complicated than an answer to this question. But what does this help? The arrival of the god to come is accomplished today in Dionysians of complexity. He who concerns himself with modernity as the period in which he exists will more than ever have to find his way back in complicated stories. I recently made an attempt to untangle one of the complicated threads of modernity in a philosophical story. I wanted to show how the deep psychological mediation of body and world had been obligatory for modern individuals before the models of Nietzsche, Freud and Jung existed. One has to reach back into the period of the French Revolution to observe the decisive moment at which the unconscious began to emerge. The unconscious is the name for the sources at which the modern, i.e. post-religious, retrogressive metamorphoses of subjectivity lead back to that which preceded it. The body and the drama are the material foundations of this modern consciousness of retrogressive metamorphoses. We experience in them the way in which the narrowness of the subject breaks open when it resigns itself, Nolan's Volans, to the universal context of which it has long since unconsciously been a part and from which it will never be permitted to escape. Any, inward, any inwardness is interwoven deeply and somatically into the magnetism of the universal. It 
It has been said that the three decisive revolutions of the 19th century were the politicization of the proletariat, the cultural seizing of language by woman, and the discovery of the unconscious. Could it not be that the same phenomenon was at work in all these movements, which would not only be apostrophed as Dionysian or dramatic materialism, is it not in each case a matter of the surfacing of amorous? Amorous. <laughs> is it not in each case a matter of the surfacing of amorous and plural truths that, thanks to the revolutionary exonerations of technical civilization, are able to develop a modern ecology of expression? It is probably impossible properly to understand Nietzsche's idea of justice if one views his work and his person as separate from these movements of emergence. It would above all be an unjust abbreviation to explain Nietzsche's impulse as representing only an oscillating balancing with the immoralistic, de-restraining tendencies of advanced capitalism that are produced in advance, whether this might also exhibit what belonging to the image of an active nihilism together with its constructive, excluding, exterminating determinations of value. One would be much more likely to do justice to Nietzsche if one could conceive of his work as a play in the twilight, the twilight of the idols of metaphysics, and the collapse of idealisms. This would be appropriate to the emergent movement of the excluded physical and dramatic forces. After having been wounded, banished into the darkness and forgotten, the bodies that have all too long been abused as incarnation machines press towards the light. They make use of modern exonerations, authorizations, and symbolic constructs to prepare for a new intervention by the lower elements, for a new presence of the basis, which cunningly, and as a rule, behaves as if it wanted something in particular, and as if it were fighting for a place in the sun of subjectivities, while at bottom it is always only looking for a chance to once again, once again become aesthetic and appear in the arena of absolute self-representation. But whereas, among these basis movements, the proletarian and feminist movements are more easily caught by the traps of subjectivity of abstract individualism, the emergent movement of the unconscious, even in its ego-psychological reversal and its therapeutic alienation, remains the most promising manifestation of the three. The depth psychologies, which for 200 years have increasingly left their mark on the physiognomy of intellectual Europe, are the characteristic impulse in the history here described as Dionysian materialist. They conceal the most important reasoning potential of an enlightenment that is not only instrumental and strategic, only they are prepared to consider properly the reality of the drama under the conditions of modernity. Wherever they remain true to their authentic impulse, they reject the deliberate indolence of rationalism and decline to cooperate within the abstract individualism that is only the psychic legal form in which the universal domination of a nature-exploiting theoretical moralistic subject wants to prevail. The depth psychologies are, as it were, the thinking heart of the modern, which must beat during the epochal history of refusing light to the physis if all bodies are not to atrophy into intersubjectivized fighting machines and self-consciously cold legal entities. This heart thinks in the centre of Dionysian passion, within the memory of the ecology of suffering, among which are included even the reason of exonerations and the constructions of what is in endurable. It is the living memorial that the history of the wounding of civilization has accumulated within itself, along with all of what must be consolidated in induration and obscuration, in order to bring forth the dominant degree of intellectual armament and the armouring of the body. Admittedly, this all sounds a trace too dark to satisfy the needs for understanding. In case one anyway, and of one's own accord, does not know what could be meant. Is the author here making a game? following the example of the more recent French authors of cultivating darkness as a genre of the beau arts? 
Or is it plausible that the veil over these references to a depth psychological drama of knowledge should not be understood as a malicious component of a literary nature, but instead illuminated as a ways and means by which the thing itself is there for us? How could our thinking, if it questions the limitations of its performance, circumvent the insight that it cannot render everything transparent? With the acknowledgement that the rational world is situated before an a-rational background, and that transparency is able to unfold only before the massif of what is non-transparent, enlightenment can leave behind it the arena of an omnipotent, illuminating infantilism, and reach the level of a maturity that can criticise reason. What Merleau-Ponty has observed of the philosopher, that he carries with him a shadow that signifies more than the factual absence of potential light, can be applied to the whole of the Enlightenment. What does this all mean? Well, it is easier to say what it does not mean. It does not mean, for instance, that something like a depth psychology-related enlightenment of society should be undertaken immediately. It does not mean that we should make something of the insight into the dramatic, dark structure of subjectivity, something like a psychotherapy in the spirit of the production of individuals who are simultaneously Dionysian and socially functional. It also does not mean that it is high time to shift over into a loving interaction after centuries of organised egoisms. These negations do not intend to posit anything against loving inter interaction, psychotherapy, or the spirit of enterprise. What is being negated, or at least interrupted and ceased in its impulse, is this indisputably false reflexes that direct our behaviour towards enterprise, production and transferal. These reflexes, which are all supported by the myths of praxis, precede modern procedures for problem solving and the ideologies of engagement. No other phenomenon illustrates this more clearly than the dramatic centrepiece of modern reason, against which even the depth psychologies have been defined. For depth psychological processes, to define them in Nietzsche's terms, these are the drama, tragedy and phenomena, are, according to a type of their occurrence, precisely that into which no production process or business enterprise can reach. They are the ontological model for what, because of its own form of being, can for us... Excuse me. They are the ontological model for what, because of its own form of being, for us, cannot be achieved, induced or produced in accordance with a method. They stand out within the dominant rationalism of availability as monuments to the unavailability of what is most real. This remains always something that happens or does not happen beyond the subjectivities that are in operation. Passionate love, spontaneous memory, phenomenological insight, pure success, a happy synchronicity, a clarifying failure, timely separation, the bursting forth of primordial pain. All of this paraphrase is an area in which the will is not able to have its way. We cannot be silent about the fact that, in any case, even depth psychological consciousness has almost no defence against its attempts to establish itself in the form of technical praxis and to accept thera putocratic social activism. Therapeutocratic. Here the recollection of Nietzsche's theory of the drama can once again prove useful. For Nietzsche clearly realised at the beginning, long before he set out on the trail to power as the universal formula of nihilistic activism, that the sort of tragedy in which mere calculating subjects play themselves is no longer possible. The show of the individual is the end of theatre. One is reminded here of Nietzsche's critique of Euripides. The overpowering drama unfurls whenever individuals are not 
actors in their own volition, but rather conduits for a phenomenon that is older than their awareness of themselves. The authentic drama is consummated as a Dionysian passion of the physis, which phenomenologically reminds itself of its individuation, its destiny, and its future. Accordingly, drama is by its very nature psychodrama. Psychodrama, however, is the unity of memory and phenomenon, of knowledge and destiny. Therefore, enlightenment commands an indissoluble relationship to drama. Even though the modern organisation of knowledge tends to reformulate all problems of enlightenment into questions pertaining to the power to dispose of information. Knowledge, however, is the phenomenon of all phenomena and the destiny of all destinies. It continually has the character of a psychonautical process that is spun out on Ariadne's web of the terrible truth. We must remind ourselves that the search of the hero, the conqueror and the patient of knowledge, begins as a flight from the terrible truth. It can become a discovery if it leads to the conscious acceptance of the truth that has occurred and is occurring. On its spiritual journey, the subject is a non-divine, non-sufferer searching for a divine patience, which is only another way of expressing the Dionysian integrity of life within the unity of lust, pain and knowledge. Thus Dionysian wisdom does not teach a release from suffering. It does not believe in an evasive movement that leads upward. To a much greater extent, it gives us an understanding that at least frees us from suffering on account of our suffering. Would it then follow that a therapeutics that is tragic, in Nietzsche's sense, would be the guiding light for an enlightened enlightenment? Would it provide the model for that understanding that could not be compelled by any procedure or rendered controllable by any method. One would not have to hesitate for a moment to write down this observation if a profession of a dramatic therapeutics were not once again being misunderstood by the activistically tainted zeitgeist as a declaration of a position with a view to practicality. Thus the second, more elevated enlightenment must begin with a hesitancy. An enlightened hesitancy is a glimmer of meditation and of epic patience that has more to do with the psychonautical adventure than would be revealed at first glance. For psychoanalysis in the current sense of the term can occur only if the subject is set aside so that its history, its drama, can be told. The term psychoanalysis here of course refers not to the compromised Freudian undertaking, but rather to the whole of psychonautics, that is, of depth psychological enlightenment occurrences that for approximately 200 years have concerned themselves with the post-religious absorption for the subject into the space between aesthetics, therapeutics and Dionysian reflection. To attribute such a high place value to attribute such a high place value to depth psychological dramaturgy within the process of enlightenment is in no way intended to channel water towards the mills of therapeutic actionism. The psychonautical phenomena of modernity are not directed towards guidelines for action. Their process is eventful enough in and of itself. We have, in any, in, <clears throat> we have in any case, few models before us as suggestive of the fact that it is not rational action, but rather a rational willingness to allow things to happen that can become the prerequisite for knowledge and enlightenment. He who knows from experience what this formulation means will perhaps be able to judge what elements are at stake in such speculations on the relationship between doing and permitting. It is a matter of nothing less than a sensible division of reason between the poles of subject and process. This is what must be characterised as post-metaphysical learning processes. A therapeutic drama at the level of universal civilization, which would be carried out without anyone authorizing or ordering it, would be a learning process that could bring an end, bring to an end the assault of active nihilism, with its assignments of value, constructive measures, establishment of levels and eliminations. 
Heidegger probably indirectly had something of this sort in mind when he cited Hilderlin's, quote, but wherever danger resides, there also grows salvation, end quote. A planetary therapeutics that would occur without having a new central subject positioned above it seems to be the only thing that could bring the race for the salvation of subjectivities to a halt on their own account. Any activity in this area, even if it were the kind of trust-building measures that seem to have come directly from the vocabulary of Mephistopheles, would have to prove themselves as mere continuation and in the meantime, even children have learned that the great abysses of the present are all located as they were before on the straight line of continuation. Whether the name of the therapeutics of checking, and here the term takes on a fatal ring, must be catastrophe. Under any circumstances is the question of our age. If it is expressed in thought, whether the name of the therapeutics of checking, and here the term takes on a fatal ring, must be catastrophe under any circumstances is the question of our age if it is expressed in thought. One must let the thousand lesser devils for whom this is no longer a question, but rather a hope, have their poor malevolent fun. Our reading of Nietzsche's book on tragedy leads to a sort of guideline for Dionysian learning, a term for which one could also say therapeutics, psychonautics or psychodrama, yes even politics, insofar as one understands the expression in accordance with the concept of night elucidated earlier. Dionysian learning intends the flaring of insight to the point of danger, to a knowledge at a razor's edge. It characterises thought on that stage from which there is no running away, because it is reality itself. Life is the trap that is a stage, and the stage that is a trap. It is precisely within Dionysian learning, however, that Apollonian safety measures are necessary. The dramatic impulses of the actors may not be translated directly from the aesthetic realm to the political. Walter Benjamin's warning on this point is still valid today. They must first be subjected to an Apollonian intervention that regulates the political ecology of suffering. Under today's conditions, a political act would have to slip all too rapidly from impulsiveness into fascism. Let me put it this way. During the plunge from the body of the mother into late capitalism, the pain of individuation accumulates for which late capitalism as such cannot be held responsible. However close this reflex may be, and as numerous as the discourses may be that tell us in the course of the instinctive search for the guilty party, where he can be found. To process this pain, which belongs not to the realm of social information, but rather to the cycle of life on a sub-political level, a self-aware anti-political therapeutics is required. Not to depoliticize individuals, but to deneuroticize politics, to protect the political from psychodynamic movements and Dionysian short circuits. By therapeutics, I mean, of course, not only the operation of psychologizing subcultures, but all techniques, rights, and games that contribute to the pleasure pain ecology of social life. All paths of conscious life. All paths of conscious life and all lines of psychonautics. If my mythological, poetic, shamanistic and neo-religious lines now increasingly appear among these, this does not indicate, at least from a functional viewpoint, an insult to the modern by a new irrationalism, but instead speaks to a well-meaning release of politics from the suspicion that it could be immediately responsible for the self-compositions and the sufferings caused by individuation in individual lives. Within the new multiplicity of psychonautics, a mature sense of the distribution of possibilities is revealed. One's misery thus consists not so much in one's sufferings as in the inability to be responsible for them. One's inability to want to be responsible for them. The will to accept one's own responsibility which, as it were, the psychonautical variant of the Amor Fati, 
indicates neither narcissistic hubris nor fatalistic masochism, but rather the courage and the composure to accept one's own life in all its reality and potentiality. He who wants to be responsible for himself stops searching for guilty parties. He ceases to live theoretically and to constitute himself on missing origins and supposed causes. Through the drama, he, carry, he himself becomes the hero of knowledge, the patient of truth. If enlightenment is carried out in this sense, it leads to a Dionysian autonomy. This is as far removed from the autonomy of the subject of idealistic modernity as the embodied existence is from the illusion of overcoming existence. The Dionysian therapeutics that has been spreading from European soil into the planetary standard for 200 years contains the most pointed challenge to the dominant forms of pseudo-enlightenment, which is continually searching for causes and other guilty parties in order to finally establish itself, driven by the dream of becoming a subject or a god, as ideal successor in the place of the guilty. Who can wonder that, in the course of the pseudo-enlightenment, the account books of suffering of humankind and nature are bulging to the point of catastrophe. He who senses the ruinous element in this uncontrolled pseudo-enlightenment will recognise that Nietzsche, in spite of his unpredictable deviations and his malevolent tones, does not preach a counter-enlightenment. To a much greater degree, he, like no one else among the greater figures of modernity, set about to understand the concept of enlightenment as adventurous thinking to the very limits of pain. Almost 100 years after the onset of this illness, Nietzsche can finally be read as he deserves to be, as one of those who, because of a Dionysian consciousness, raise their voices against the universal conspiracy of active indolence, so that they can report to us on the loneliness and the heavy, heavy happiness of the unloved animal who says, I. Even he, together with some hopeless hardness and his sad bottle of separation, can be read as someone in whom the tender empire of the body wanted to learn to speak once again. With his pathos of integrity, his feeling for sound and his intellectual passion, he is not so far from the reciprocal cautions, to take up Jürgen Habermas's beautiful formulation, with which those who were born later are able, with a little communicative luck, to give their existence a better turn. It remains futile to ask what would have become of Nietzsche if he had unravelled the thread of Ariadne that led to her, the mistress of the labyrinth. His stage was from the very beginning constructed as a labyrinth, from which there was no escape to another. In his dramatic coming out of himself before the eyes of everyone and no one, however, he burrowed through, turned around, pushed to the pinnacle, and brought to an end an entire system of values, an entire civilization, an entire era. Those who live after him have an easier time of it. He has warned them of the three unforgivable original sins of consciousness idealism, moralism, and resentment. But nothing in Nietzsche's writing can have as great a continuing effect as his own refutation of his theory of the will to power. His whole life contradicts it, and testifies to a stimulating fragility that is turned towards us, like the hardly disguised interior of the terrible truth. Wherever he is wounded, endangered and ingenuous, it is there that he is still among us. Wherever his icy abundance buries him alive, it is there that he anticipates the fate of all later individualisms. Wherever he walks with transparent optimism over abysses, it is there that he demonstrates what it means today to be contemporary. And wherever he affirms the course of the world that is crushing him to death, so that he can create a space for his self-affirmation, it is there that he is a witness to the happiness of those who are without hope.